right. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> How are you? How's it going? It's, I'm doing great. Um, Jeff came down from New Hampshire, and uh, I'm just sitting here shooting the ship before we start this, and um, he brought a couple of awesome Euro- European mounts that he does himself here. And one of them, I don't know if that one's not on camera, is it? The there's a, there's a short video on this one, yeah. Yep. It's uh, something like on the track for five hours, I think is uh, okay. the name of it, but yeah. Yeah, so Jeff's, Jeff's got an awesome YouTube page. I think it's probably one of the, probably if not the biggest, one of the biggest northeastern hunting hunting pages, and you do some great content. Um, and it's just Jeff Doyle on YouTube, right? Yep, Jeff Doyle. Yep, and he does the Tracking 200 series he's been doing the last three years. Right. This will be. That's right. This is yeah. going in the third season of that. Yeah. So um, these two bucks that we'll we'll talk about, he uh, will be on his YouTube page. You go check them out. Um, one of them, we just got done talking about this Massachusetts buck. It's beautiful. You got some great footage of it. What did it end up scoring? Uh, One forty four and four eighths. One forty four and four eighths. Yep. And um, you get, the mass on this thing is incredible. Do you want to just kind of give um, a quick story of that buck to, to get going here? Yeah, and, and uh, folks could find it too on the, uh, it's the next Ridge buck is what it's called in terms yep. of video. Yep. And, and this buck was, it was the last day of the season in Massachusetts. It was terrible weather. And I even thought about, you know, not going to the spot. Just the, the roads were terribly icy and everything. And uh, I got there and I thought it might be a little crunchy. There was a little bit of crust, but the weather was... Um, we had a little bit of weather, uh, a little bit of, you know, wind, cover up some motion. And I came into a buck track right away, right away, right out the truck. So I parked, I tracked that buck down and I jumped him out of his bed. I got a little look at his rack and just decided it wasn't, it wasn't the buck for me that day. And I don't usually kind of take a gamble and jump off a, a buck. It was, it was, um, you know, like kind of a basket rack buck, right? So I said, well, I'll, and I'll on the going. last day, on the last, last day. Yep, yeah. Yep. But I had been in there tracking <clears throat> like the week before and, and I'll tell you, I had seen this, um, when the a buck had fed in the snow, these, you know, it was, they were eating acorns and these big tine marks in the snow are nice and wide. And it just, it had, it was in the back of my mind. I can't lie. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what time did you jump off of that buck and go after another one? I was there right at, at daybreak, so I probably spent about an hour and a half, two hours tracking that buck. Okay. And I jumped off at probably about nine o'clock, and I I went until almost noon when I was going up. Like I said, I'd gone to the next ridge, right? Yeah. I'd worked through a whole bunch of different sign, and in Massachusetts, there's a whole lot more deer sign than when you see up north sometimes. So you got to really kind of filter it out, and uh, I was just going up kind of cresting this ridge I'd never been on before and I cut this you know big hot track I didn't go very far and he came into a trail fresh with a whole bunch other deer tracks and I'm kind of looking it up and down and trying to figure out which way he went number one but realizing that with all those other tracks he was probably in there on a hot dough or you know looking looking for a hot dough towards the very end of the season so um I was kind of getting my things together i blew the grunt call a few times and i saw what looked initially like a deer running at me and i thought well maybe it was running away from me because it disappeared so i was just saying too that my camera i run the camera all the time yeah and i was i was thinking man i've been on the same battery for a long time better change it which was a good thing because the battery was dead so i, I squatted down changed the battery out in the gopro and uh when i stood up i looked in the, and i could see a deer walking away from me and I pulled the gun up, have a scope on the muzzle loader, saw bones as he took a step as he's walking through a little opening and pow. And uh, I got myself, you know, together, reloaded, I pulled the gun and I'm looking, just scanning, looking to see if I can see anything. And I see him standing there broadside and I can see the rack. I mean, big rack from the side. This is kind of the first time you get a great look at the rack. At the or, rack, yeah. yeah. I knew I'm like, I'm like, he might be at 10 point. So... It seemed like I waited there forever. It was probably just like two minutes before he took a step. But he was dead on his feet. I didn't know that at the time, but he had taken that and then just, you know, took a 50 caliber bullet and then yeah. just walked off like yep. 15 yards and stood there. He took a step and I shot and he disappeared. So I reloaded again and went up there. And when I kind of came over the hill, I just saw that rack like sticking off of the snow. <laughs> Usually their head's down in the snow a little yeah. bit. You know, sometimes it's a surprise. You, you got to pull it up. It's just so wide that, yeah. He's just sticking out of the snow, and uh, 
I knew I was onto something good at that at that point. <laughs> and is that is that when you said, "Yeah, baby, yeah," the <laughs> exactly. Jeff the Jeff Doyle signature? <laughs> what if I mean? It, I mean, it, the video doesn't even do it justice in person. I was just holding it, um, just a heavy, heavy rack, beautiful. He looks like he was old, and they said he was four and a half, right? Yep. I'm just a great genetic four and a half year old. Yeah, I take a four and a half like that any day. <laughs> oh yeah, any day. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned. Um, you know, you you stopped and had to fiddle with your camera a little bit, and that's kind of what helped you get the buck. You you might not have you think you. I mean, you probably would have caught up to him, but it was pretty perfect timing. You sometimes if you if you stop and I've been out with you know fiddling it on X or looking at on X or you know staring at it for a few minutes trying to figure out what I'm going to do, and I can't tell you how many times that I've seen deer had deer walk up to me while I'm doing that while I just take a little tiny tiny break. Um, so maybe there's something to that. I don't know. I, if... I think you're absolutely right. I mean, so many times I'm I'm really mobile. I kind of got the wanderlust, is what I call it. Yeah. I just I have to keep moving, and I know it costs me dear. Um, but when I stop, I, I don't think I've ever really seen one stop for very long if I'm walking. Yep. But if I stop, and then I can hear something, sometimes I can catch movement or know there's an animal there, right? Yep. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have done it. So. Yeah, the camera, the GPS, the phone, all those are mechanisms that kind of get me stopped. And other people, I think, as well. Yeah. Other people, um, I'll tell you another story. So this goes back a few years before cell phones were really... Um, back in the flip phone days? <laughs> yeah. I think it might have been a flip phone. <laughs> so uh, I was up in New Hampshire. I'd hunted this mountain uh, quite a few times, and I had a couple of good bucks on camera, but I really hadn't encountered a good one yet. And I was... Uh, so I was to talk to my wife. She was in Germany at the time, traveling for work. And I knew I had to call her at 2 o'clock. That was the plan. So I needed to get to a spot that I had good reception. So I climbed up the <laughs> mountain higher than I had before. And uh, 2 o'clock came and went. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And um, I said, well, I'll get the grunt call out. So I grunted a few times. And eventually she called me. And as we're talking, all of a sudden I realize I hear <laughs> crunch, 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 crunch. And, uh, and don't you know it, by the time I get my eyes, I, I'm like, hold on. <laughs> I put the phone down, and by the time I get my eyes on the buck, he's already walking, he's already passed me a little bit, and he just kept walking. And I just, I kept pulling to an opening, and it would be his rear end. I could not get ahead of him and get on his shoulder. I never pulled the trigger. Um, but sometimes being stopped is an advantage, yeah. right? Yeah, and I think um, if, they're, if they're close enough to hear you, you know, crunching behind them, then you stop. They're like, "Well, I gotta go check that out now." Sometimes, you know, come yeah, come see right. what you are and and why you stopped. Um, I mean, I was just scouting yesterday, and I jumped a little six pointer and out of his bed, and I was up on a little knob, and I crouched down. He he stopped after he you know took five or six bounds and stopped, and I crouched down, put up my binoculars, watched him for ten minutes. He was just standing there for a while, and then slowly coming back in closer to me, and then he saw me move because mosquitoes were all over me <laughs> i had to start slapping him i was like i don't care enough about this six pointer to you know um not not hit these skeeters so I, he saw me about it off but yeah i mean when you stop and just uh take a break stuff's gonna happen sometimes right yeah yep um you don't have to worry about mosquitoes when you're tracking though you don't you, that's <laughs> the best part about uh hunting in the winter and yep. the snow yeah um so you talked about um, you, you used to bow hunt, but you don't bow hunt too much anymore, and probably a little bit because of that wanderlust, right? You just have to get out and that's right. Hit the mountains. I spend a lot of time in the tree, um, waiting for deer to come to me. Primarily because I, when I moved to Massachusetts, you got to get your um, your your license to carry in order to have a firearm. Yeah. Unless it's a muzzleloader, but um, and and folks can look in the law. I'm not an expert on the law, right? But yeah. uh, I. I tried to bow hunt out here when I moved from central New York to Massachusetts and then eventually went to New Hampshire. And once I was in New Hampshire, I could have my guns again and, um, without getting that license. And that was when I kind of said, all right, I'm going to put bow hunting to the side for a while. Is that when you first, is it like, when did you get into tracking and how'd you get into, into tracking? So growing up in central New York, you're right there in the, um, in, in the weather that comes across the Great Lakes. Yeah. So we got a like a lot of lake effect snow. And being in the Adirondacks, we're not in the uh, we're in the Tug Hill area, which gets a lot of lake effect. We're just enough lake effect to have really good tracking seasons. And I was I shot my first buck tracking 
when I was in college, probably in like 2000. And that was just a, it was a small four point, but it was my first one. Yeah. And then 2003, I shot a, a big seven and a half year old um, buck in the Adirondacks. And he was, he was like a big four finger track. Mm-hmm. You know, for anybody that tracks, they know if you put down your hand, you got four fingers in the track. Um, that's a good buck, you know, real good buck outside of Maine. If you're up in Northern Maine, you know, you might have more four finger tracks <laughs> than, <laughs> than yeah. you will other parts of the country. Yep. But, um, yeah, yeah the Adirondack so, tracks are much smaller than the main tracks, right? Yeah. The deer are just smaller, but yep. the racks are actually, um, you know, they, they compete pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Are you, so were you growing up on the Western side of, uh, the Adirondacks? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, my deer camp in Vermont is not too far from the eastern side, you know, and um, right on the, you know, New York border, Granville, um, you know, Glens Falls, Saratoga, like it's over in that part of Vermont there. All right. So I know the eastern part, but um, yeah, so you grew up, who taught you how to to track? Yeah, my dad was always in hunting and, uh, you know, he's kind of my my hunting hero, if you will, still. And uh, early on, he'd take me to... Uh, you know, into the big woods, but also to some seminars. So um, people like Jim Massett, um, even Tom Massett, these guys were doing seminars back 30 years ago. And and those guys hunted pretty much exclusively in the Adirondacks, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. Their father was a guide. Um, they've got a great story, and, and there's a there's a book out by um, it's uh, you know, Jim Massett, um, Joe Danito, um uh, a few other guys, Steve Grabowski, I think, are in, in, it tells hunting stories from the Adirondacks. So they can go into that, but they they really grew up doing it. You know, around the same time the Benoits were doing it in other other states. Yeah, these guys were doing it in the Adirondacks, mm-hmm. and so um, that, along with you know Larry's book on how to bag the biggest buck of your life, I think hooked my dad. Yeah, and I grew up right at the right at the border between the northern zone and the southern zone. So we had we had great deer country. Where I grew up, I could go out the front door and hunt. Yeah, both the back and door early and seasons and late seasons, right? That's right. Yeah, but as I got older, like we'd skip the southern opener, we'd go up north to hunt. I wasn't interested in seeing a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of yeah. shooting and shotgun range. We'd go up north where it was quiet, yeah, and just you know enjoy the big woods. And so that's where I kind of realized the type of hunting that I like to do. All right, if you folks are looking for a muzzleloader, you can't go wrong with a Woodman Arms muzzleloader. They're made locally, right up here in New Hampshire. They are accurate, dependable, the most accurate and dependable muzzleloader on the market. People from all over the world are buying this gun. Um, It's extremely light. It carries great. You don't have to clean it if you use Blackhorn 209 powder, and it just keeps shooting and cutting holes in the paper like you wouldn't believe. Um, I've went around and shot a couple friends, muzzleloaders, they're, they're woodmans, and uh, they are plunking them right in there, as Lanny Benoit says. And um, I haven't received mine yet, but I can't wait to. I'm sure they all shoot exactly the same because the owner there, Mark Woodman, is a machinist and an inventor. And, I mean, he has crafted this thing to shoot with precision. Get on to www.woodmanarms.com, check them out, or give Timmy Bolduck a call, 603-608-7218. He uh, knows everything there is to know about those guns and will be happy to take your call and answer it. So you're, uh, when did you first start tracking? How old were you? Like, when did you, um, when, when, when did you, you probably were tagging along with your dad for a while, and then... Yeah, I mean, we, he'd take me hunting, started more seriously probably when I was like 12, I'd go a, a few times before that, but then we'd go out a lot of southern tier, and then I think when I was 14, we started going up to um, to spend some time in the Adirondacks, spend some more serious time up there, and uh, you could get your license at 16, so I did, and uh, I shot a good, you know, a, a good Adirondack buck my first yeah, year, yeah. which was uh, kind of like it started what would be this process with my dad and I, we'd go in the woods and he'd us- we'd usually separate. And then next thing you know, I'm calling him back and saying, Hey, I got one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we went up on top of a mountain that he'd hunted before. And, and I remember hearing something. And so we held up for a while. It was dry ground. It wasn't track and snow and a little button buck came past us. So we carried on our way and 
he sent me on this little ridge. He was going to go put a little push on, just do a loop. Mm-hmm. So I got the grunt call, and I, I blew it a few times. And before I knew it, here was a little six-point coming over my right shoulder. And so I was going to have to turn, like, you know, 180 yeah. degrees, essentially, to shoot him. And he got in, like, 15 yards before I was able, before he finally spooked. And as he turned to ran to run, I, I didn't have a lot of experience shooting that gun, but I shot a lot of squirrels. Yeah. With a 22 in a scope. Yeah. A, a lot. So that helped me. I just I just whirled around and shot him, and he's he's down. Um, so that was kind of the start to uh, to the Big Woods adventure. Yep. And what kind of uh, what do you use for a gun? And do you have a scope, open sights, or what do you what do you use these yeah, days? Yeah. You know, the, there's a difference between the woods and the Adirondacks, and what I found in yeah. At let's, least let's pro- touch on that. Like the Adirondacks are pretty awesome for a lot of people some people listening aren't going to know what the adirondacks are but um you know i always grew up lake champlain and you know my dad would always as we were driving look over there those are the adirondacks right (laughs) it's like this really mystical awesome forever wild place a million acres i think right yes yeah and you can't you know forever wild just means no what no logging no 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 road systems are going to be put in right it's forever, right. forever wild. So it's just no. I don't think there's any motors allowed. Like yep. they're pretty strict on even mountain bikes. Yep. I don't know where they're at today with the like the e bikes, but because of it, there's less understory, right? And there's just a lot of big mature woods. Mm-hmm. So there's areas where you can see a long ways. Yep. Um, there's other areas where you get blowdowns and you're at the top of a mountain where it's thick, but it's kind of a different thick from what I've seen in northern New Hampshire and Maine. So. A lot of guys will use scopes versus open sights because your shots are a little bit longer. Yep, you can see further. Yep. Yep. And so I use a, it's a Remington Model Seven uh, FS, which is they only made them for three years. It's um, kind of a specialized gun. It's got an 18 and a half inch barrel, and it's very lightweight. It's got a, um, a Kevlar fiberglass stock. It's always five and a quarter pounds without the scope. Wow. So a gun for the late 80s that weighs five and a quarter pounds is pretty light by today's standards yeah you know compared to like the titanium guns mm-hmm. and uh i've got one in seven millimeter 08 one in 308 one in 243 that maybe my girls will like <laughs> <laughs> but um i switch between the seven millimeter 08 and the 308 yeah. i like both those in the adirondacks um even though you're tracking most of the time so you don't need to focus on food sources but it's because there's no understory it's pretty much mass you gotta find right yes you gotta focus yeah. on the mast crop, and when there's um a good beech nut crop, like the deer are out all over the place, and they're on those hillsides and they're digging in the snow. Um, that's I don't really know if it, if it makes it any easier, but there can be years where there's just a ton of food. Yeah, and the one thing that's there's a big difference is where the, when the bears hibernate. So if there's mast crop, the bears will be out. Otherwise, they're in early. You want to see a bear track during the snow. So you're not focus. You don't you don't really focus on. Um, on the mass crop as a tracker though right what are you focusing on this t- t- typical stuff you know you find a you find a signpost rub and you're marking it down and on x so you can always go hone in on that you know and look for a track sometimes are you doing lanny you know i was just I had the podcast with lanny a couple more parts coming out um by the time this is out all three parts will be out but he said you know he does a lot of driving you know a lot especially on the, those main logging roads he can spend a whole day, a couple days driving and just getting a lay of the land and, you know, mentally remembering where the tracks are and where the bigger, the bigger ones are that he wants to go back and key in on. So how does that relate to what you, what you do? So I've learned, I've learned a lot from the Benoits. Um, they've got a great strategy and they kill some monster bucks. Uh, the driving the roads is something that we didn't do initially. Like it was just not even on the radar, yep. right? You would just go park. And you'd walk your butt off till you <laughs> cut a track. Yep. And a lot of times you'd catch the track trying to transition in between, you know, the top of the mountain and down in the swamp, right? Yep. And if he was going up, then you were going up. If he was coming down, then he was probably going up the other side. Yeah. <laughs> so um, adding that uh, driving to the repertoire, if you will, for tracking was a, was a big thing for me getting out here because... I didn't have all those spots that were kind of passed down from like generation to generation. I had to find my new, you know, new areas. Yeah. And since then I've become like, I'll just go wherever there's snow. If there's snow, I'll look on the map. I'll find a place to hunt. I go there. I don't worry about finding deer, um, yep. finding a buck. All you need is some public land. And 
driving the roads gets me onto a buck track quick without having to really know the land. Yeah. I think that's nice. Yeah. And I've I've picked up, um, I picked actually, technically this buck right here. Uh, we picked this buck up, um, his track from the road. He's an Adirondack buck, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And uh, <laughs> when when I'm with my father, and you know, it doesn't matter who's driving, you know, you're you're punting with a partner. When you're driving on the road and you and you see a track, usually you know the process is you like you kind of lean out, throw them in the window, and you lean out <laughs> and you kind of look at it, and then if it's a possibility one person usually gets out and then if it's a really good one you know flip a coin for both, it. <laughs> both guys get out and you're just like you're like holy shit and uh we both got out on this buck track and i remember being like you know come with me let's let's go do it together and, and he's like no and he said you know go kill him that's his thing <laughs> go kill him and uh he, he took the back track and ended up seeing i don't know two or three coyotes that day on the back track of this buck. Your dad took the back track? Yep. 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 And I took the track. This is a long story. No, let's go. We got time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one though. So um I, I was on the buck track for five hours before I got for anybody that can't see this now you will, but this buck has fangs too. So all right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was in a kind of an area where there wasn't a lot of deer. So it was really easy to track. Like in terms of me following the track super easy yeah i wasn't gonna lose it no barn yards no so i at one point when i was tracking him i heard blue jays and i suspected he was up in front of me every so I, hunter always when you hear blue jays you're like that's gotta be a buck yeah you know? and yeah and it's never been one for me yet but <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was probably who knows it was probably like a pine marten or yeah. something yeah uh, because i took it slow for a long time and i got up and found his bed several beds and he had fed and there was this this like big beaver pond and he was on the edge of it and then he walked across it <laughs> like i don't know about walking across that it was ice ice over. yeah yeah so <clears throat> i took the long haul around it and then we ended up you know taking him up over a couple of ridges uh small little ridges like little knobs and then he went down into the end of a end of a swamp and when he went through some brush it was just this is an important thing for me to share i feel like he went through these trees that I said, no way could a big buck get through this. You know, he, yeah. would, he would have broke those. It was these uh, these spruce branches. They were the dead ones. Yeah. And I was like, oh, man, all this time and I've been following a little crotch horn or something, yeah. you know? So um, I was like, well, I'm invested. I'll stay on it. <laughs> so <laughs> I was second-guessing myself. Good choice. Yeah. So I took him up onto this last knob, and it was getting to be later in the day. And the wind was blowing a little bit, and there was just um, some beech leaves still on the trees. And the wind would blow, and those beech leaves would rattle a bit. And then they'd, and I'd take a few steps, they'd stop, and I'd just look. And again, I'm seriously looking for a small buck now. So I do this for 30, 40 minutes, you know, just taking it slow, because I can see where this knob is going to drop off. And if it, if it really drops off, it's probably over. And I had seen he was feeding at this point, too. I got almost to the end of the knob, and I'm like looking, and all of a sudden, he moves his head, and he's 26 yards away. You were looking, were you looking for a bedded buck at that point, Don? You, I was, yeah. Because he was looking, feeding? I was looking for, I, I thought he might be bedded, that's why I was taking it so slow. But I was really looking for just like a, a small buck, like a, a little yeah. rack. Yeah. And at 26 yards, the back, just looking at the back of him, I was just like, oh my god. And, uh, I could just see the top of his head. So I blew the grunt call and he like looked left and looked right. And uh, I thought, I don't know if I wanted to stand up. So I looked back and there was a stump behind me. So I just stepped up on the stump and I could see, you know, his whole, whole body to the side, you know, broadside. And I just pulled the trigger and he just kind of just went like this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you got the, yeah, baby. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know. Can Apparently, you hold that one up real quick? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that thing. He's got that back scratcher there. Yeah, that one looks like it wanted to be a drop time. It was like trying to <laughs> trying to turn into a drop time. That's a six-and-a-half-year-old buck. That's the one that was four-finger wide, too, right? Yep. Yep. Beautiful. Okay. So, you know, I guess what would you normally do at that <clears throat> point today? You'd probably, like be texting your buddies right oh yeah 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 or a phone call right away or something <laughs> so 
Um, Larry's got a story about the biggest buck he ever shot. He lost in the snow. I knew it was going to snow terrible that night. Larry's story, you said? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Larry Benoit. <clears throat> so there was this giant boulder, and I thought, well, if I drag him up against this boulder, I won't be able to lose him. I can find the boulder. And we got like 12 inches of snow that night. Oh, yeah. That's what you mean. I, he After he killed one, he couldn't get back to find it. Yep. That's yeah, right. Yeah. 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 I remember that. Oh, so, that'd be devastating. So <laughs> it was like four, I think it was like 4.15 when I left the buck, right? And it was two miles as the crow flies. Yep. And I probably got out of the woods at like 7 o'clock that night. And uh, I was all pumped up, you know. I was, I was like, come back to tell my father I shot this buck. <laughs> what year was and that one? This one? 2008. Yep. 2008. Yep. And that was your biggest buck at that point? It was, yep. 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 And so I, I, I'm walking out and I see the headlights. And I had this like little 15 lumen headlamp it was terrible it was, it was a brutal walk out so i get out there and there's another guy there right and and this guy's name is stan vicky who we're, we're end up being friends with yeah we had just met my father had just met him they were both waiting for me and you know stan would have helped out if i if i needed help i think um you know recovering me and so i was like did you get him and i'm thinking i just said no <laughs> <laughs> You didn't want anybody else to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I didn't want him to know. So I, I said, um, I was like, no. And so I hopped in the truck, and he and he's just like, oh, I can't believe you didn't get him. And I'm thinking, well. <laughs> How long am I going to pull this charade? <laughs> and I had dropped my camera in the snow, so I didn't have, um, I didn't want to turn it on, you know, destroy whatever digital media is on there. So I waited till we got all the way home. And with the snowstorm, we met some guy who's in the ditch. We got out. We pushed him out of the ditch. And it was a long, long ride home. Wow. Yeah. We finally got home, and I, I popped the SD card in the computer. And uh, sure enough, there was the picture. So I was like, I was like, hey, come take a look at this. And he, he was in disbelief at that time. I'd held the secret for, uh, I don't know, a few hours. Yeah, that, that takes a lot, of, <laughs> but, yeah. a lot of patience. Yeah. And that's a beautiful yeah, animal. Fun. Beautiful buck. Yeah, so what's up with the fangs, though? It's got these... You know these uh, these fangs coming down. Yeah, so I guess this is like a throwback to when there are some deer. I think they're in Asia right now where they have fangs. Yep, I've seen them. Yeah, Those little tiny deer. Yep. So yep. I guess this is some kind of genetic throwback to when they had. Maybe it's like the ivories yeah. out of um yeah. out of an elk. But yeah, these there's just little yep. little tiny fangs on it that probably wouldn't even have shown had not done it's the an uh, ancient European. genetic mutation that popped back in. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. And that one you said was six and a half years old? Uh, 600,000. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 600,000. That's a BC buck. <laughs> Boone and Crockett. Yeah. <laughs> um, sweet. So those two bucks are uh, are beautiful. So what do you do for scouting? Do you got any cameras out now that are like, you know, do you have target bucks ever? Or it's because you don't know where you're going to be, you're going to be in uh, anywhere the snow flies, right? You know, sometimes I carry around a, a camera in my backpack, and I can never find just the right place to put it. Yeah. I could probably take some advice from people on that. Oh, it's hard. Because... It's much harder in the big woods <laughs> than, you know. Because you wonder, do I want to commit to coming back to this place That's right. ever again? Well, I saw you posted something about one of your one of your cell phone cameras, your cell cams you have out there. It's been out for a year and a half. You don't have to go back in there, yeah. right? Yeah. No, the one I put up. What, there's a um, video on my page of moose hunt my father and I did. Yeah. And it was actually on the way to that moose hunt. I hung the camera in, two th- in September 2019, and the batteries are still going. Yeah, you're still getting pictures. That's what I, Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I don't get a lot of traffic um, at that camera. And if I did, I probably would have been back there last season. Yeah. Um, but, but you yeah. don't ever sit, right? You're always tracking? If, if it's... um. You know, dry, crunch, crunchy like cornflake, mm-hmm. potato chip leaves. I'll sit, but but you're kind of you're kind of like wishing. Doing it. Yeah, you're kind of yeah. wishing inside. I hope I hope I don't fill a tag here. I want to do it tracking, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know there's I, there's some, some rule of thumb numbers. Like if I call, I try to make myself wait five minutes. That's an eternity. You know, if I rattle, I try to make myself wait twenty minutes, thirty if I can, but I get antsy. Yeah. Yeah. So and what do you um you hunt New Hampshire, New York, and Mass? Pretty That's right. Much? Yep, and we did yep. we did a trip to Maine last year. Went up northern Maine. The um, the the conditions were really icy, so it was kind of tough 
conditions yeah. hunting. The one day it rained, I got onto a buck track, I tracked that buck down, and I messed up my camera. There's a there's a video on the on the channel. It wasn't a big buck, but he he was it was weird. He took me up onto this um, logged off knob. Yep. And it was all these little whips, and he bedded right down on top of them. I mean, it wouldn't have been comfortable for you and I, but uh, he took right off out of there, and it was first or second day. So there, I mean, there's no I was up. I like going big or going home. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. What do you do, like New Hampshire, you hunt New Hampshire first, and then or New York first, and then late season you do Massachusetts? What's kind of your lay of the land there? Yeah, so... Because I know Ma- Mass is a really late season, which is cool, compared to Vermont. I, I mostly do Vermont and uh, Vermont and Mass, so Vermont ends early, and uh, you still got three weeks or so in Mass. Yeah, Mass, Mass is a great season, because a lot of times you'll have snow. Um, it's post-rut. I actually don't like tracking in the rut. I've tracked... So many deer that, and I, I watched the the, the uh, web episode with with Lanny on YouTube. You know, he talks about bucks that are just walking in the same direction. Yeah, and yeah, you know, they never stop. Those, yeah, yeah, they just they just carry on the same direction, and they, you know, they'll stop and make a rub or you know make a scrape, and you think, okay, they're gonna slow down, and then they just turn, they just keep going the same direction. Um, but anything can happen in the rut. Yeah, right? it's a good time to be in the woods. One can come running by from a different direction, or, mm-hmm. um, but if I've learned, though, if I get on one of those tracks and he's just lining out, it might not be worth my time to try to catch up to him. I don't know. You have regrets, too, yeah. if, you, yeah. if you don't track one yeah. all the way. So early season, my strategy now, because I am trying to shoot a 200-pound buck in New Hampshire. That's what the whole Track in 200 series is about. I will pull the trigger on a have good buck. Have you killed buck. a 200-pound buck yet? I've killed um, two in Canada, Yep. up in Canada. And i got to say, this six-and-a-half-year-old from um, the Adirondacks, we boned him out that day, so... Who knows? Yeah, yeah who knows? Yeah, he was a four-finger track. Yep. So, um, I, I want to get one in New Hampshire. That's kind of what, what the series is about. And, and then you keep killing these big bucks in, in Massachusetts. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I really think one of the best shots to do that is during muzzleloader season. So, that muzzleloader season is still... It's, it's that pre-rut... Um, they're oh, yeah. gonna put on their most weight, I think. You had not me think in December. I was like, "How could it be?" But New Hampshire's muzzleloader is yep. early, right? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So if we get snow, <clears throat> I was close last year. First day of the season, New, um, New Hampshire muzzleloader, we had snow. I picked up a big track, and but that day went from really cold to then melting out, and essentially ran out of good snow on them. Uh, and I went back and I hung and hanging a camera there. It's a good buck. Yeah, so you that's know, all I'll say. you'll key in on that one again at some point. I would like to go back, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go back and pick up that buck's track. And yep. it's pretty, it's a big four-finger track. Now, do you normally do, um, so New Hampshire you can get three bucks, right? So you you're not can, worried, yeah. isn't there like a three, isn't there a three buck limit in New Hampshire? If you, if you bow hunt. <laughs> if you bow hunt, yep. okay. Otherwise, How many, how many with a rifle, just one? Just one. Okay. Yep. And that, that counts towards your um, muzzle loader too. Okay. So if I got one with a muzzle loader... I'm tagged out. Yep. But but then you can go to New York or Mass. Yeah, exactly. Or Maine. Um, so, do you have you killed a lot of bucks in New Hampshire, or you're kind of holding out for that big one? You know, have you been have you been getting bucks in New Hampshire? Um, it's either three or four that I've killed in New Hampshire. Yep. I, I no, I'm not necessarily um, holding out for one that's that's 200. If I see a good racked buck, and and you know what the other thing is. For me, while well, I've shot some good rack bucks tracking, it's all about the hunt. If I was to see one of these guys like in the middle of the road, and uh, not that that's legal, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, if he was in the if, road and he jumped off and you could get out and get off the road, yeah. it wouldn't feel the same. No, I wouldn't want to burn my tag on something like that. Yep. I'd rather shoot a smaller buck. Yep. So if I'm in and I have a good hunt and get to the end of it and, and I have a good chance of that buck, you know, I'll make the decision at that point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep. Um, so your scouting, your scouting is basically always done during, is it d- done during, during the season? season yeah. Yep. And it's, and you're kind of just saving that info for next year too. Yep. yep. And I'm part of big woods. And as part of that, we've got the, um, Onyx maps and oh, yeah. I use Onyx all the time. Yep. I'm constantly, that's, I've got a bank in my head, but even I forget things I've seen. So I'm... 
on the night before I have, I'm looking through Onyx and I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at potential. I'm always thinking about where am I going to find a track? Yeah. That's one thing. Yeah. If you don't find it from the road, if you don't get an easy one and that's harder these days because other guys are out there trying to find tracks on the road too. Sometimes you just got to get off. I don't like driving around much. I, I feel like I'm burning my day. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I'm always looking at Onyx and I log a lot in Onyx, a lot that I see during the season if I'm tracking. All right, you guys have probably heard me talk about Onyx in the past. I use Onyx religiously, whether I'm hunting in the big woods or I'm hunting in the suburbs. Um, it's great. I drop waypoints in there where all my cameras are. I can preset some stand locations and you know put in, oh, this is a good stand location for a southwest wind or this is a good stand location for an east wind. You can put in the icons um, to have different colors, so you can color code stuff, which I find super helpful. If I have a spot that I still need to get a camera out, um, I'll, I'll put the shade of my camera icon in there uh, to white, so I know that I got to go and, and put a camera up in that location. Once it's there, I turn the shade to blue, so I know it's an active camera. Um, I, do a, I use it a lot. Um, property boundaries is great. You've got a line distance on there so you can tell how far away you are from different structures like roads. Um, so you make sure if you're in the suburbs, you're hunting in a legal spot. And then in the big woods, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a security blanket for you. It's, it is a GPS. It's a much better GPS than those little handheld things you got to put in your pocket. So um, you can download maps before you go out into a spot that might not have sounds, uh, a cell service. So you, you make sure you always have the map um, on your phone, whether you've got the cell service or not. Uh, it really is just an invaluable tool. And if you guys want to use, uh, sign up for the first time, we've got a special code. Use code HS20 for Hunt Suburbia 20, and you guys will get 20% off on X Maps. So go to www.onxmaps.com and use code HS20, and you'll get 20% off your membership. Uh, you will not be disappointed. It has helped me kill deer. Over the last few years since I've been using it, I'm addicted, and um, it is just another tool in the toolbox, but a necessary one. So get on to onxmaps.com. Use code HS20. Um, one one unique thing happened up in New Hampshire. So I was tracking a buck, and he – it's kind of a sad story. <laughs> he, 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 he took me out around the edge of this logging area, mm -hmm. and I, I'd never seen a buck do this. He, like, stopped and actually backed up and then – turned and he walked like 10 yards this way and he brought me right over to some black ash and he hit him there were these like the size of my calf mm -hmm. you know maybe the size of some people's bicep um <laughs> <laughs> black ash they yeah. were rubbed and he hit him and i was like i'm like wow that he he either smelled those from where he was and where he kind of backed up and did this turn where he like thought i'll just go check him out but i marked him and then i went back the next year and they were all cut down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's just awful. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 But there's a... Uh... Yeah, but so they prefer... They've got their preferences. Um, Lanny was telling me that, you know, every buck has got... If, he's, if he hits ash, he's going to hit only ash trees. Or if he likes, um, you know, uh, pine trees, he's going to hit only pines. Or he's going to hit... All, like, they... Even, even though it's, you know, geographically... Um, there's a lot of it is geographical too, but um, a buck they have their own preference on what they want to hit for a rub. Yep. Yep. And that's I think that's pretty cool. And if you got the real dark antlers, then they're hitting the dark, you know, the darker trees. And if they got the big the white antlers, they're hitting you know hardwoods. And um, I just think that's pretty cool. Every, yeah. every single animal is different. Yeah. And um, regionally, like in Massachusetts here. And I imagine other parts of the states that are more southern where they don't have black ash or brown yep. ash, yep. they definitely will have signpost rubs that are not on ash trees. Yeah, this is the one I found yesterday. Oh, wow. Is that a cedar? A, yeah, it's on some big cedar. Yeah. And it was the, you know, that one was like, it's like that big. It was a, it's a nice one. I think they and, love those cedars. Oh, yeah. That's all I've seen them on down here are on cedars or, um, yeah, or different different species of pine but um always on the softwoods here i mean i found a few in vermont i think they're on kind of different stuff there there's not very many ash trees in vermont though mm -hmm. where i've where i've been um but yeah how'd you so how'd you get involved with big woods bucks um 
you're so for everybody listening, he's an official team member in Big Wiz Box and you know Hal Blood's crew there. How'd you how'd you get involved? Yeah, I, I don't Chris Chris exactly, reached out to you, but um, I went up to a show and I think I had started. Oh, I think I had started my YouTube channel at that point. Yeah, I had some videos up and yeah, um, through a mutual friend, got introduced to Chris and Hal. Yeah, chatted with them about you know my ideas and the way I hunted, and they said yeah, they kind of. Um, we're interested in bringing me on as a team member. Yeah, and you know we've been uh, been part of the group ever since. Yeah, you got to go up there and kill kill one from uh, Parlin Lodge. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those guys are great guys. Um, Chris has been Chris helped me start the pod this podcast, um, and I was helping him a little bit with some some branding and sponsorships on on the Big Woods Buck side, and he was like, "Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll show you what we do." So I basically used the same setup. Um, that those guys use and they're just um, super knowledgeable dudes and super fun to get along with too you know yeah and you know what they uh, I mean the the level of expertise and the quality of hunting those guys do is just it's it's top notch right but they also they want to share and part of that mission for Big Woods is education yep. and sharing with the public and I think you know whether it's a youngster that's your own kid or someone else's or an adult that's just coming into it. I feel like we're all a little bit obligated to kind of pass that along. And that's one of the things that Big Woods does the best. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, the, the hunter numbers are, are dwindling. So we've got to get right. young, young folks involved you're going to get your daughters into it. Hopefully. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Have they showed any interest yet? Yeah. They, they like, um, how old are they? I've got a seven and a three year old. Seven and three. Yeah. yeah. And they both, they're both very interested. Uh, I want to put them on the right pace. Yeah. So we, we scout together. They're, they're interested in uh, when I bring one home. Yeah. That's always, yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, that was the exciting thing. Oh, dad's coming home with, with a buck. Let's go look at it. <laughs> yeah. Let's hear the story. The highlight, yeah. Yeah. So they, my older has been asking um, to go. And so we'll, we'll, we'll take her, you know, we'll get out there and... Uh, What's New Hampshire's law for age limit? So New Hampshire is there's no age Live limit. Live free or die. So. <laughs> yeah, you just you <laughs> yeah. at least it used to be you just cut that little um, little tag out of the back of the uh, the syllabus and you know you got your tag for your your uh, youth. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very simple. And I I started hunting I think when I was eight in Vermont, so it's there's no age limit there. But Massachusetts, I think it's fourteen. I don't even know. I haven't looked into it. But yeah, some states is super late. I mean, yeah, I looked into it. So um, the states tend to reciprocate with one another in terms of their, you know, their youngster hunt. So you can a youngster can hunt the various states. Just call and talk to the conservation officer, you know, locally to figure that out. Uh, New York just changed the law, which is I think huge. Yeah, so let's talk through. Um, so there's a couple laws that changed in New York. A lot of big changes actually, right? In there hunting. are. Yep, there are. Yeah, let's talk through those a little bit. Because New York's a great state to hunt. It's, it is. It is. It's got all different kinds of terrain. you got the Adirondacks where you can go out to Finger Lakes and, you know, um, wine country out there. And there's, you yeah. know, there's so many different awesome types of hunting in New York. And it's huge. Yeah, and you so, got even the Catskills. Yep. The Catskills is more like, you know, Pennsylvania, from what I understand. Yeah. And the Adirondacks. Yep. Out west is more like... You know Niagara County. There's some huge bucks that come out of there. That's more like more like uh, Iowa. Yeah, yeah, Ohio. So um, when I was a kid, like I said, you couldn't deer hunt until you were 16, and they've just changed that. They've they're doing a pilot program of um, 12 and 13 year olds, so they can hunt with a firearm. That's good. In counties that have adopted it, I think that's great. Yeah, get them introduced younger. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't believe you can't hunt until you're 16. That's, yeah, it's crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I I got my um my small game license when I was 12 and then my father wanted me to be able to go. And so we, uh, we did the archery. You can archery hunt at 14. Hmm. Yep. yep. There in New York. And yeah. So they, that was great. And... <laughs> they, they just changed one other thing too. The, uh, orange. Yeah. So when I moved to New Hampshire, I hunted up North and I wore snow camo, full body snow camo. Yeah. That's an Adirondack up. thing. I see. Yeah. Yep. I don't think anyone in New Hampshire had ever seen somebody walk around in snow camo. In fact, this one guy was so surprised, he was looking at his scope right right through me, or looking through the scope at me. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> but, um, yeah, they, they just changed it. So up north in, in New York, people are going to have to either wear orange or pink. 
I think is a neat. How much? I, I think it's um, a hat and a vest, something like that. So there'll be some hearts broken because yeah. if you've worn snow camo. I was going to say, like, I've seen Joe Donito and his group always does that, right? Yep. And it's, I mean, it's effective too. I'm not going to lie. When you see a deer just, like, look through you, not even see it when you're wearing, like, Predator white snow camo, hmm. it's pretty effective. But I even started wearing just, just orange. You know, based on some of the comments from videos, it's there's people hunting all across the, the country wearing orange. Yeah. And I think it's with a family and kids, it's it's more more responsible to wear something that's orange. Yeah. Well, I texted you an article um, earlier today that so there's there's a guy, a um, really unfortunate incident happened in Colorado, um, elk, elk hunting. And I'm just going to pull it up so I get like the name right. But this guy from Pennsylvania was out elk hunting, and um, there was another fellow in there um, bow hunting for elk. And the bow hunters don't have to wear orange. I think the gun hunters do have to wear some orange in Colorado. So he was bow hunting, and he was in camo, and um, the guy from Pennsylvania saw movement through. You know, he was he was closing in on what he thought were you know some some bull elk but it was just the other hunter also calling and he saw movement through the brush and very irresponsibly shot at it you know he saw a white flash he said and he, he shot at the white and it killed the guy and that's like you know that's awful and you should never you should always everybody you take hunter safety identify your target even before you look through the you know don't don't even look through the scope um, unless you're pretty sure that, you know, that's an animal. And definitely don't take your safety off and pull the trigger. I mean, that was super irresponsible. But, yeah, like, who knows if the orange would have saved that guy? Probably, you know. Um, but At least an orange hat, right? At least an orange hat, yeah. It's, but, yeah, super sad story. I just saw that today. The guy got charged with um, negligent, negligent manslaughter or something like that. Yeah. So... Anytime you're you're calling, whether it's turkey or you know elk, any other species, I think you got that opportunity where you're making both sounds of you know female and the male. Yeah, you got the chance that you can call somebody in. Yeah, I was in um, I was in Colorado, elk hunting with a bow a few years back, and I went down to this wallow for um, for an evening sit, and I just kind of brushed in a little blind right behind these uh, th- this vegetation, and as the sun was starting to sweat, set, I just I let out a, a bugle, and this bull bugled up in the woods. And then I heard another bull bugle down below me, and some cow calling. And I started thinking, oh man, I'm in like a hot spot. These, <laughs> yeah. these, and and the bull below me started bugling, and then the other one started. And all of a sudden, I hear the bull above me starting to come down. And that bull came down. He ended up coming down to the wallow, and I, I got a shot at him, and he 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 took off up over this hill and. About 30 seconds later, a guy popped out from where the other bull. Below you? Yes, it was the guy. Yeah. So um, we weren't probably at risk of, you know, making a bad decision and shooting one another with the bow. But uh, it definitely can happen where you're calling somebody in like that. Yeah. How often do you go out to uh, Colorado? We've done uh, three trips. Three trips. You and your dad? And and two other guys. Yep. Yep. Two other father, son. Yeah, I mean, every a lot of a lot of people are doing that these days. I definitely got to get that on my list. It it is a it is an awesome trip. It really is. Do you, you have to put in for? Um, do you have to put, draw can, a tag or? You can do over the counter. You can, or you can accumulate some points. We hmm. tend to accumulate some points and then go every few years. Yep. What's the difference with the over the counter and accumulating the points? Um, you can get into, you know, a region. better zones. Yeah, a zone with more more potential okay i mean we haven't i haven't gone out there and hunted a zone that we didn't need points for so i know there's guys that are successful over the counter but um i've found when you take a trip like that you got to spend maybe even the first year just exploring yeah Yeah. like when we went up to to canada uh spent the first year just bouncing around all over the place we saw some good sign but it was actually the last day we found the spot that we we've gone back to and you know been successful there so you kind of got to almost sacrifice that first year and say you're just going to find where you're going. Yeah. I probably, if I took that approach with um, with deer hunting, um, probably would have been more successful sooner out here, having moved, moved from the Adirondacks. Mm-hmm. So, and um, you're, you're deer hunting when you go to Canada, right? Yes. Yeah. Just going for track and snow? Um, 
sometimes there's not snow up there. And hmm. so that's where I, I learned to do a lot of vocalization with the deer. I'm not going to say like the vocalization the guys do out west, <laughs> yeah. but where you're, you're walking through just really thick stuff and using the grunt call, rattling, rattled in a lot of deer up there by comparison, right? Yep. Um, it's just, it's thick, thick vegetation. So I think they're used to being in a really close proximity to one another before they see each other. And there's um there's a few times where, yeah, you, you, you're you set up and you hear something come crunching in after you call. This one buck just about gave me a heart attack. It was so thick. He must have popped out like 10 feet from me. <laughs> yeah. And I could hear him coming for like yeah. 15 minutes, you know, just waiting to see what he was. And he ended up being a small buck. But um, that's a that's a great spot. Actually, yeah. that shed. You see that shed? No. That's from up there? That's from up there, yeah. Wow, look at that. Very little chew marks on it, and that is just some mass. Yeah, they they get beefy racks and beefy bodies up there. Hmm. Yeah, that's an awesome deer, man. If they uh, if they have a good winter, I think that's what it comes down to up there. And there's wolves too, which you know another apex predator. Yep. But. Do you do shed hunting, like like, or just if you happen upon one, you grab one? Do you go out and and I'll go out in the spring. I like to use my turkey season mm-hmm. as a scouting shed hunting season. Yeah. So I'm always doing multiple things at once. Yeah. And I'll, I'll carry some, um, I'll carry the camera sometimes, hang the camera on a scrape if I see one, just to leave it there. Because with a family and a, and a full-time job, yep. I'm like a lot of folks, my time in the woods is real limited. And so tracking allows me to maximize my, my season in one day. You know what I mean? You, yeah. You, you're... You get up in the morning, and that can be the start and end of your season. It's all you need, really. Yep. And the cool thing about tracking is, you know, if you once you get on track, you know that, that there's a buck at the end of it. That's know? right. And yep. So you're up in your odds, really, than if you were just going to go sit for a week, you know. I, I heard you might be doing some tracking with uh with Lanny this season. <laughs> if I can, yeah. Like I've I've got a full time job and a wife and a new kid too, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sure I'm gonna be pressing luck uh for hunting time but yeah if lanny gives me a call and i can make it happen i, I definitely want to tracking's been on my list you know i've i've kind of unofficially I, I went out a couple times in massachusetts down south when we got a lot of snow and there's a big chunk of forest down there and um i went with a mission to track and i got on a buck track i think it was a small buck and tracked all day and uh, never came across them, but I got in the game and, and did it with my muzzle loader. Um, and in Vermont, you know, if it's snowing and I don't feel like sitting, I'll putz around. But I've never taken it super seriously as like, you know, well, if I if I make it a goal, like you did with your track in two hundred, mm-hmm. you know, and you really you're 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 like super set on that now, right? You you have to kill a two hundred pound New Hampshire buck tracking. <laughs> Like, if I get that mindset for tracking, that's what I got to do. That's going to be one of my goals. Like, I don't think this year it can be a goal. If I have the, the chance to do it, I'll do it. Maybe 2022, it's going to be, like, a serious goal for me just to kill a buck tracking. The funny thing is you can, you can be successful your first time out yeah. with it, really. Yep. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of those stories. But so when you come to Mass, are you going big, big woods? Or do you sometimes, can you track in a... You know, is, do you, are you ever going by a 200, 300 acre patch and and getting up into that to track, or you really need thousands of acres? I I don't really measure the the size of the area. Yeah. But I mean, some of the areas I've turkey hunted that are closer to home, mm-hmm. right? They're smaller woods. I've popped in there, but you, you it all depends on what's happening with that buck. You know. Yeah. If they're if they're coming a lot of ground, you know, you need a lot of space. Um, you're you're gonna, uh, you know, I'm gonna get frustrated if I'm walking. And, and Massachusetts is different than New Hampshire. If you go off that state land, you don't have the right to be on it in Massachusetts. Yep. You know, you got to have permission from the landowner. So if you, if the track goes off, it's gonna end in pretty, you know, some frustration. Well, actually, the state law in Mass is if it's unposted, you don't need permission. This on the state law, but many, probably most of the towns have a town law where you do. Okay. Um. But there's you just have to do all your research town by town in mass, which oh, is unfortunate. Going, yeah. yeah, but I bet you know I've heard Berkshires are great for tracking, I and mean, Berkshires just an extension of Vermont going south, pretty much. That's um, right. A lot of big you know big woods, big land. So 
yeah, next year, if I don't tag out with Bo, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out to the Berkshires, and I've got my camp in Vermont, go to Vermont, and um, tag along with Lanny would be great, and I want to go to Maine. Maine's on the list, too. Yeah. We're so spoiled up here in the Northeast. We've got so many states that we can hunt, you know. It's a hard, Northeast is probably the hardest place to hunt, you know, in the country for deer. So much competition. It is small compared to those western states. But you really can hunt, you know, you could kill 10 bucks if you wanted to. <laughs> if you had the time, you could go to all these different states and uh, and hunt them. Yep. You know, bounce over to Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Mass, and Connecticut's like, good. Like we said, the woods are different too. So yep. you get a lot of different areas that you get to see. And the seasons are staggered. And, yeah. you know, New Hampshire muzzleloaders early in Vermont, it's late. You know, so there's so much opportunity. Um, so one thing I asked you about real quick is, um, and I want to, I don't think you have seen anything on your channel yet, but YouTube came out with these new policies on monetization, um, specifically around hunting content. And you've got some video, and do you see any monetization at all on your YouTube page or do you have to kind of be in a partner's program? Um, mine are monetized. Oh, they yeah. are. Yep. So, all right. So you're part of that program. I forget if you need to be at like 5,000 subscribers. Yep. I'm right around nine now. So, yep. yep. So this might affect you. So the bigger pages, um, just started talking about it. They're, they're demonetized because most, a lot of their videos are showing a distressed animal or a kill shot, which you can't monetize now. Any kill shot videos, um, or post kill shot like prep of the animal you know gutting it out or um quartering any of that stuff you can't show it on on your video or they demonetize you so i mean that's pretty pretty scary to think for guys who do it full time i mean yeah. it's not your full time job right it's a passion but still what do you think about that i think for for the bow hunters right when they film their hunt yep you have maybe some scouting you know pre footage you have the bow hunter in the tree yep. making the shot, you know, when the animal, you know, animal comes in, they're making the shot and then the recovery, there, a lot of the videos, video centers around that successful shot. Yep. That's true. And it's very like intimate and plays out. It can play out and like, you know, zoomed in on HD and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So those, I think those, um, content creators, you know, may struggle with this new ruling. I, you know, we're using the Google platform of YouTube kind of they make the rules i guess that's that's yeah. how it works but um i've thought about some of the videos i've created and i try to bring a bit of what i enjoy in the woods i mean there's a i've tried to do a little bit of cinematic stuff yeah. in some of the videos um you know a little artsy but right now i just want to show just the process because what was so i was posting videos and i was getting a lot of feedback that people are like this is real hunting you know i'm not trying to knock anybody else's stuff but saying this is this is like what we do this isn't out west and i thought you know to be honest it it actually there's a whole lot more to it too it's not just the days you go out and you're successful Mm -hmm. it's all the days that lead up to it yep and that's what i wanted to show with tracking 200 yeah so that's what i've that's what i've tried to do and so a lot of the videos don't have any they don't have any kill shots they don't have any distressed deer yeah and that's great Um, yeah and eventually you know that's the goal i'll have to be a little more careful about what i put in um I think showing a distressed animal is just not my not my style at this point, um, you know. And, and so I don't have to worry as much about the kill shots because I don't have the the option to like zoom in like some of the folks do right. with the bow shot. Yeah, but even what's I think that post shot, you know, sitting there with with your animal and talking about it, you know, that's that's no good anymore. Wow. So. I don't know. Start I mean, our own channel. Yeah. Start, start your, your own platform. Yeah. Well, those, some of those bigger, uh, bigger guys, the hunting public and seek one and hush. And they're all, they're all kind of, they're floating that idea of starting their own platform, you know? Um, but I think that's just takes a ton of capital and a ton of, you know, I don't know, band, just bandwidth, um, yeah. to be able to do something like that. And then YouTube's got all the eyeballs. They kind of, you know, they kind of got you. And, and if you're monetizing videos, that's, you know that's the livelihood of some of those folks too. Oh yeah, All those guys—that's what they do. That's their whole. That's their job. That's how they make their money. So they kind of go to um, turn. They say they're going to turn to like apparel more if it, you know if they have to and 
if you like their videos, buy a T-shirt or a hat, and that's going to support them instead of instead of the ad revenue, you know. Yeah. But um, you got to make yeah. a yeah baby yeah shirt because I'd, <laughs> I'd get one, I would get one of those. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe you guys have to look for the look at it on the channel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe BWB will make one. There you go. And uh, put it up in their store. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, hey, thanks so much for coming down, man. I appreciate you came came down. Uh, I don't know what was it, an hour or so drive. Yeah, came yeah. down for the ride, um, and it was great talking with you. And these bucks are awesome. Everybody that's listening, um, go subscribe to to Jeff Doyle on YouTube. Um, check out his videos, and we're gonna watch you kill a two hundred pounder this year. I bet. I sure hope so. In New Hampshire, we'll give her hell. Yep. All right. Thank awesome. you, Patrick. Yeah. Really appreciate the time. Thank, thank you. All right, folks, uh, deer season is right around the corner in many states. I mean, it's starting up in less than oh, just about two weeks from now. Um, so get on to www.heronhill.com and stock up on some wine, both for yourselves and, of course, for your wives and your girlfriends. Get them a case of wine and uh, butter them up a little bit before deer season. Uh, give them something to drink at night while they're waiting for you to get down off your stand. You got deer all around you and you're... You're up there in the dark waiting for them to go away so you can get down from your stand. they got to be enjoying some some wine during that time. So stack up, uh, get yourself a case, uh, go to www.heronhill.com. They'll deliver it right to your door. Make sure you use code HS5 for Hunt Suburbia 5. So code HS5 for an additional 5% off the all the volume discounts they already got on there. If you get six bottles, you get a volume discount. You get 12 bottles, you get a bigger discount. And then you can add on HS5 for an additional 5% off. These guys have been a great supporter of the podcast. Please support them. Um, get whatever kind of wines you like, but I like the Eclipse Red. Um, they've got a Game Bird Red that goes really good with Game Birds and pairs well with venison. It's got a little bit of a fruity taste to it. Uh, go on there, get whatever you like. If you've ordered from them before with code HS5, just go on there and use the, the volume discounts they already got. It's already an incredible deal, um, and I'll get credited for uh, the order as long as you use HS5 at least once before. So, again, thank you, everybody, for your support. Um, tell your wives thank you for letting you get up into the stand a little bit extra this year. Don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash Hunt Suburbia, as we'll be releasing a lot more video content this year. Big bucks I've been dreaming often, every night till I'm in a coffin. Vermont woods to the burbs of Boston, I'm looking for a tree to get lost in. Chris Warner's little dust in the snow, quality time just me and my bow. Fall evenings, I know just where to go for some quality times for me and my bow. It's just me and my.